Well, we've been uh, together a week now. This is Friday evening. So, a week that's lasted a hundred years. One of the um, questions, considerations that uh, comes up a, a great deal um, is uh, how we can take the um, the different elements, the things that have been uh, useful, meaningful during this uh, retreat time, and how do we translate that into the other world? And uh, because most of us are not going to be staying here at Amaravati forever. Uh, some of us are, <laughs> ever, forever-ish. <laughs> but uh, most uh, most of those uh, of us gathered here are going to be uh, off to different environments, um, back to uh, living in various towns and cities, um, back to various occupations, and living amongst people who are not keeping the eight precepts, who, uh, or even five precepts, <laughs> or even one or two precepts, <laughs> uh, and um, outside of the situation where you have wonderful people preparing food for you, other people looking after your accommodations, and um, the uh, uh, the world where we have to make decisions, where we have to uh, uh, say take responsibility for uh, actions, choices, comings and goings, uh, and all of that. So the, the, the consideration of how to, to bring the, um, the principles, the, the qualities that we've been looking at here, and how to, how to bring them into that other environment, into that um, uh, other flow of, of more sort of intense or demanding or you know, compelling uh, perceptions and experiences. Well, there, there are some somewhat obvious um, encouragements, like uh, if we live by the five precepts, or even by the eight precepts, or by the eight precepts, then we make life a lot, a lot less complicated for ourselves, and um, that. Uh, is a, a key support for carrying on a, a, a peaceful life, a life that where is um, we're maximizing the conditions for our own contentment. And so, um, I would strongly encourage that when we uh, we take the precepts and at, at the end of the retreat time on Sunday, when we go our separate ways, that uh, when um, we you're officially released from the eight precepts and you go into the uh, five precepts. That that's taken as a as a serious practice and a, a direct support for maintaining your mindfulness and your uh, spiritual commitment. Um, also, the encouragement to practice meditation every day to to find time during the course of a day, at least for for one period of of formal meditation. And uh, even though I've just mentioned these, they kind of go without saying. <laughs> these are the most of potent and um, supportive factors for carrying on the, the retreat environment because even if those around you are not keeping the precepts uh, the um, uh, the main support for our own sense of, of um, contentment and um, our own self-respect really uh, our own say, quality of uh, of ease within ourselves is the, the the actions that we take, what we say, what we do, how we live, the, the choices that we make, and that uh, that has a very direct and a powerful influence. But uh, alongside uh, those uh, those supports of um, the uh, formal practice, taking time to to practice meditation in a formal way each day, to give yourself half an hour or an hour. To, to to sit still to be quiet the um the majority of your of your day i suspect does not allow that kind of solitude or quietness and there's interactions with people there's driving along roads there's sitting on the underground in london and uh, sitting in a, in an office with a, a few other people or a lot of other people <laughs> 
those of you in open plan offices or working in institutions with with many other folks around that you have to interact with that you have to uh, receive instructions from or you have to give instructions to yeah, we, we uh, live in a complex worlds and so during those those times <coughs> it's important to have supports for uh, for the practice that are, are really beneficial to us and the ways that we can help to sustain uh, uh, like an ongoing and, and a steady uh, well integrated mindfulness well as you might have noticed uh, at least uh, from my experience and I, I think this is the case for, for most of us here where we get lost uh, most easily is in the, the realm of emotion when we're excited by something when we're afraid of something when we're irritated by something or, or somebody then that's where mindfulness most is the kind of shortest half-life <laughs> but uh, that's where we we lose the mindfulness most easily is uh, when there's a you know, emotional surge of one kind or another and uh, and so uh, during this this retreat times is something I've referred to uh, uh, somewhat but I feel this is worth underscoring and uh, really uh, taking this in and uh, develop, using this opportunity that we have just in you know, the last few days that we have together to uh, uh, to strengthen uh, and uh, say highlight this aspect of, of Dhamma practice as uh, being uh, extraordinarily helpful and, and useful to us it's like a really powerful skill so in this respect um, uh, with uh, any kind of emotion the the attention gets pulled towards the thing that is causing the emotion so that if I'm if somebody says something that I find uh, uh, irritating or intimidating uh, I feel uh, anxious or or, um, or annoyed then the attention goes to the person who just said that and the mind starts to you know formulate a response or, or, or it gets swept up in that that feeling of, of annoyance and uh, this is normal for us right this is <laughs> something that's uh, that makes us feel anxious or excited that we uh, we see something or hear something that we're really interested in, and <gasps> the mind goes towards that that sound or that that uh, that visual object. Uh, this is what yeah, emotions are, are designed to do. They, we 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 lock on to that thing that is uh, threatening to us, or is attractive to us, or is annoying to us, or that is you know, triggering that that intensity of feeling. Um, so. In this um, this situation where we're living in a very benign environment, where uh, people are encouraged to, to keep silence, we have a very um, well-established routine. Uh, we have a, a great uh, um, a quality of a uh, well-developed quality of mutual respect. So it's a very very safe container, a very benign container here. It's a really good opportunity to look at emotional reactivity. Uh, in a in a place of great uh, security and safety, because um, you know that even though someone might be really annoyed with you, they're not actually going to hit you. <laughs> they might be thinking nasty thoughts about you, but that's as far as they're going to go, because everyone's uh, very you know, much committed to the to the precepts. Or someone might be very attracted by you, or you might be very attracted to someone else, but you're not going to act on that because we've all taken the the uh, the precepts, and so this is a, a situation where you're not. Uh, uh, engaging with others in a sexual way so that the um, the environment is very benign so this is ideal uh, situation to look at those emotional surges now when uh, uh, we uh, just get lost in the the object of a, a emotion whether it's an irritation or desire or fear or jealousy or um, whatever it might be then it's very hard to 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 uh, establish any kind of clarity and so the most helpful thing to do to get to to, to know uh, emotion and to not be pulled in by that not to get carried away by the the the, the uh, compelling quality of that is to develop a mindfulness of the the physical sensations that go along with any emotion so that 
when uh, there's a feeling of annoyance with with something or when there's a feeling of, of fear of, of somebody or something when there's a feeling of a, a, a sexual excitement or attraction there is a, a physical uh, concomitant there's a physical uh, element that we uh, are able to perceive quite uh, quite distinctly and so that uh, if, uh, as we notice the mind uh, getting pulled by some particular emotional surge, some kind of outflow, one of the asavas, then um, the the trick, if you like, is to then deliberately take the attention off the object that's uh, annoying or frightening or irritating, uh, exciting, and to bring it into the body and to explore, well, where do I feel that, that anger? Where do I feel that jealousy or that, that uh, desire? Uh, how does it sit in the body? What's its what's its texture? Is it a a tightness in the lungs? Is it a uh, a, um, a knot in the belly? Is it a, a sharp knife between the shoulder blades? Is it a a, a constriction in the throat? Is it just a, a vibration over the whole the whole system? What is it? Where is it? And then when we we find that when we bring the attention to the the, the physical sensation that that goes with an emotion then uh, it's a lot simpler because we're um, uh, uh, we're not caught into the stories of the um, uh, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, or how things should be, or how we want things to be, um, or what uh, uh, is the sort of the the particular details of the of the circumstance, but rather there's a almost a monosyllabic language that the, that the body speaks. It's very it's very simple. It's very direct. Very uncomplicated. Whereas uh, when we get caught up in the in the stories and, and the kind of emotional tales, uh, so emotionally charged uh, tales, that it gets very complicated very quickly <laughs> in the realm of, of thought and, and that kind of level of interaction. So uh, when we bring attention into the body and um, and know that the feeling, the vedana that goes with any emotion, then we are, are able to to acknowledge that, to to accept that, to to know that in a full and complete and unbiased way, and then in the being able to to be aware of that sensation in the body, we're able to, in a sense, not get entangled, not get so caught up in that, and to to know that fully and completely, and to then be able to discern: well, is this a, a wholesome emotion? Is it unwholesome emotion? Is it a, something that, if it's followed, it's going to lead to difficulty and and harm, or is it going to lead to to benefit, or is it is it benign? There's much more. We're much more able to sustain a, a clarity around it. So in this, uh, if you have a, a particular tendency, like if your mind moves towards uh, anger, if you if you've got a, a real um, a strong com- uh, uh, complainer in your in a committee, an expert an expert complainer on your committee, and uh, or if you've got you know. Uh, a tendency towards uh, anger and, and ranting, or if your mind is moving more towards greed and desire, uh, you have a particular tendency, uh, then we can pick that up and explore that, not even just waiting for something to occur around us that triggers that, that emotion, but we can, if we recognize, oh, there's a strong trait of anger, or a strong trait of jealousy, or a strong trait of, of fear, anxiety, then... Uh, we can take this opportunity to pick that up and explore it. Yeah, the, if the mind is prone towards self-criticism, yeah, and um, yeah, the the object of your aversion is yourself, <laughs> we we can explore that that same uh, aversion and self-criticism. So uh, uh, this is a, a simple practice, but one that uh, I I really I found extraordinarily valuable myself, and really encourage it. So if there's a particular theme. That you want to explore, you see in yourself that uh, we can uh, take a period or several periods of meditation to to deliberately invite that in. So, for myself, uh, uh, I found that I was an extremely fear conditioned character. That uh, it was such a strong tendency in me that, uh, and it's so pervasive that I'd already been. Uh, in uh, in the monastic life, been meditating for seven or eight years before I even noticed that was a tendency. Like it was just so ever present, like the like the force of gravity. Like I mean, did you wake up this morning and think, "Oh, gravity"? 
you know, I'm sure none of us thought that because it's there every day, it's just, and it's the same every day. Oh, look, gravity's kind of really, you know, we don't make any comment about it because it's the same all the time, and so we don't notice it, we never talk about it. So, uh, anxiety was like that for myself, it was just there all the time, so I never even noticed it. It was extraordinarily pervasive, and it was only after having been uh, a, a monk for, for this, um, six or seven, eight years that I. I began to see, oh, look at that, yeah. <laughs> Whatever happens, I'm worried about it. This is my, my basic relationship to life, is if it exists, worry about it. So a basic mode of relationship to the universe is worry. You know, even the, you know, the universe is, is it, is it really going to expand forever, or is it going to reach a limit and collapse? You know, this is, this is a cause for concern, you know. So, uh, um and this was uh, uh, an area that uh, I found uh, Lumpur Sumato's advice extraordinarily helpful because he was the one who really pointed out this kind of practice and and how when the mind, say, moves towards uh, worry or anxiety, then uh, uh, he said, look, you know, he'd say, whatever emotion it would be, look, look to see where you find that in the body. And I would find it was always a, a tension in my gut, like a, a tightening in the... In the uh, solar plexus, in the in the abdomen, and uh, so I, I decided to follow his advice and try to explore this because I could see that this is so pervasive. It was such a strong habit that uh, it was um, you know, affecting everything the, the, uh, in my my world. And obviously, as uh, as a practicing Buddhist and as a monastic, you'd <laughs> you're in this business in order to end suffering. You, and I could see, well, I'm creating a lot of suffering for myself. You know? very consistently on a, on a, and on a daily basis. So uh, what I would do uh, would be uh, uh, every morning during the morning sitting, I would set a, a, an intention, a clear and conscious intention. Okay, during the, the day, today, whenever my mind moves towards anxiety, whether it's a, about something that uh, somebody has said or whether it's whether we're going to miss the plane or whether it's about um, uh, uh, how many more things there are on my to-do list, Whatever it might be, internal or external, uh, and coarse or fine, uh, serious or, or, or trivial, whatever the mind moves towards and creates anxiety about, uh, I will make the effort to take the attention off the object of anxiety and bring it into the body and to, to notice the feelings in the body and then to let the, the body consciously relax. So I would um, uh, I would set the intention to do that in in the, in the morning each day, and then as the day unfolded, then I would just make that that effort just to, to notice whenever I was getting anxious or caught up, worried in some way. Oh, look, there it goes again, <laughs> and then to deliberately take the attention off the object, bring it into the body, and then sure enough, every time there's this <laughs> there's this knot down in my my gut, and then. We're using the breath, um, particularly the the qualities of the out breath, let the body uh, relax and and uh, and let go and let the the body soften. And one of the really interesting things in this this practice is that when you let the body relax and so that you are um, say uh, allowing the the physical attribute of that emotion to disperse, then I, uh, I would ask the question: Okay, now what was it that I was worried about? And uh, if you've ever done this, you'll 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 have noticed that for a couple of seconds, the mind you can't remember what it was. You have to reassemble the fret. It has to be put back together because what was it that I was worried about? Oh yeah, right. And that and then you've got you, you know you you put it back together again and you you know you reignited the worry. But for a couple of seconds, it wasn't there. And that's extremely important because what is very vivid, uh, vividly clear at that moment is if I don't think, if I'm not thinking about it, it's not a problem. You still might miss the plane. And there's still, you know, a number of things on the, on the, uh, on the list of, uh, of to-do, uh, on the to-do list. But the problematicness of it has evaporated. Right? And so the, the relationship to the, the, the whole picture has shifted. Um, so, uh, I, I, carry, I, I carried this practice um, uh, out for, and made this a sort of central feature of my efforts for about two or three years. That sort of made it my kind of main program. 
And at the end of that time, it was it really had uh, changed uh, an awful lot. Uh, and so the 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 whole tendency to of the mind to move towards that and to to act in that uh, on that basis had, had really radically shifted. So I'm not making any kind of claims to total enlightenment, <laughs> but uh, the that uh, reactive pattern of anxiety had really dissolved, and, and I, I saw that had really shifted. So that was a you know, very good news. <laughs> And uh, and uh, quite uh, quite marvelous to see that it, it takes a lot of effort, but with effort we can we can uh, pick up a reactive pattern like that, and to to really work it through and to to let go of the the, the causes of it and to let that that habit come to a natural end. And so one of the aspects of working with this would be to, uh, and at first I found this was very helpful, would be to uh, say use of the formal meditation to uh, let, uh, to get to know what the habit was without sort of being live in the field, the actual real things like <laughs> sitting on the M25, not moving and knowing that there's a plane you're supposed to catch, but uh, just sitting in the shrine room and then sort of replaying a situation like that. Or uh, if there was, a, say, a, a tension between myself and someone else, you know, worried what they think about me, or they're 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 uh, they're being critical of me for some reason I don't know about. <laughs> and uh, so I would uh, let the mind be as quiet as still as possible, and then deliberately remember a situation that was uh, uh, anxiety producing, that, or uh, think of uh, uh, of, a, of a, a memory, or imagine a situation that that would uh, trigger that that sense of. Ooh. Oh dear! Uh, so that um, whatever the emotion might be that uh, you you're looking to explore, anger or jealousy or um, indignation, self-criticism, fear, uh, desire, to uh, to literally deliberately drop a seed in to drop so the like a, um, a that in as a catalyst to trigger the emotion. So you let the mind be as quiet as possible. Then you you drop in that memory or that thought or that person's name that you're particularly uh, averse to or obsessed with, and then whoosh, watch the uh, the emotion arise. And at that point, the most helpful thing or the most important thing is then to take your attention off the story. So as the mind launches into all the wonderful things about this person that you're obsessively in love with, <laughs> or that you're obsessively <laughs> averse to, <laughs> or uh, that uh, all of the the good reasons why you're you know, you're not really jealous about this person, <laughs> to take the attention off the story and bring it into the body. Okay, what does jealousy feel like? What does what does uh, aversion feel like? What does desire feel like? Where is it? What's its texture? And that's the most difficult. At least in my experience, it's the most difficult element of this practice is to leave the story alone and to just go directly to the 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 physical quality of it but if we if we do then just to bring the attention to that and just to, to notice how that is in the body and to receive it accept it completely and the more that we're able to accept it uh, then it's like you've also accepted where that emotion has come from you've accepted that element of yourself of what has uh, say caused that emotional reactivity so uh, as you say uh, you can say uh, you can Say how, if you've drunk from the stream, you've also drunk from the source of the stream. That you've you've, you've kind of imbibed, you've taken in where that's come from, as well as uh, uh, as just having that the sort of uh, the the physical sensation of it. You've also, to some degree, accepted the the um, the habits, the reactive patterns, the the uh, deep rooted identification and loves and hates that have have driven that thing that are kind of sustaining that in your in your uh, habit patterns uh, and the degree to which we can accept it and and receive it and and know that just as it is simply as an attribute of nature then to that degree we're able to really integrate it and to, to no longer be caught up and carried away by that so then with this kind of this kind of practice to then uh, allow it in to let that be known in the body and then just let it be sustained for a few minutes and then consciously start to let it go and to again using the out breath to relax the body and and to re release that uh, reactive pattern and uh, um, 
it can take you 10 seconds to trigger the emotion and 45 minutes for it to fade. Yeah, this is this is a very common experience, <laughs> particularly if it's like something that's particularly um, exciting or upsetting or or the the mind's fixated on. But it's important to stay with it and just let it um, work through the system until it really has faded away to nothing, until the body's relaxed and the mind has returned to that quiet, uh, spacious, open quality. And then. Uh, in that, you, there's been a, a receiving of that whole cycle. You watch that that uh, that that feeling come into being. It's been born. You watch it uh, do its thing and then fade away and reach its cessation, its niroda. So the, we, we've um, been uh, attentive to and, uh, and generated the quality of, of loving kindness, acceptance for the whole cycle. Uh, so that then we are able to see, oh look, that whole thing came out of nothing and dissolved back into nothing. That, that's all it was. And that um, when we, we work with that in the safety of a retreat environment or the quietness of our own meditation space or our own shrine room, you know, where, where the, um, the, per the other person is not there or the situation is not actually present, then we're in a way learning that skill in a very benign environment. And so then when you're in the, the living situation, back at the office or out on the the M25 or <laughs> wherever, that then when that's, uh, that same emotion is triggered in a live situation, then on a very fundamental level, you, you've already you've trained yourself, oh, I know what this is, I know, I know this cycle, I know where this goes, this is uh, one of those patterns, I don't have to be drawn into this, I don't have to get obsessed or caught up or excited, you know, intimidated by this. So this is a, a, an extraordinarily helpful skill to to develop and to, to to use because in the flow of our, our daily lives, uh, there's you know, emotions being triggered on a regular basis, and uh, we're drawn into to difficult situations and habitual compulsive behaviors of one kind or another, and often we feel fenced in and trapped and, and burdened by those same patterns. And we can feel like uh, it's hopeless, or we, we, we're out of our depth, or we have no, uh, no ability to work any, uh, to get any perspective. But this kind of, of practice of working with emotion, and in a very direct uh, and practical way, I've found to be extraordinarily effective. Uh, I was telling some, some, talking about this earlier today, and telling some people how. Uh, and I realized that my my relationship to to anxiety had changed a lot, but it was most it came home to me most in a most striking way when um, I did a, a walk through England in, in 1983 from Chithurst Monastery up to the the newly opened uh, Harnham Monastery up in Northumberland, and I wrote a book about it, and um, so I was extremely familiar with this. I've written the book and obviously had proofread it and, and knew the text inside out. And then, uh, uh, about twenty-five years later, uh, a couple of the people who we'd visited on the on the walk said, uh, "You know, if you ever want to make an online edition of, of the of the book, then we'd be happy to help you prepare that." So, oh, thank you very much, very good. And so, um, they they did this whole text, and then they they forwarded it to me. And so, I, um, I was checking it, proofreading it to see if it if it come out uh, all right. And so I had to read the whole book again from beginning to end, which and I hadn't read it for for many many years. And what was start was so startling and shocking was that every single page there was I was afraid of this. I was really worried about. <laughs> I was really fr you know I was really frightened because I thought this is this is bizarre. It's like every page was riddled with fear, and I was you know, worried about this and anxious about that and afraid of this and and worried about that. There's page after page after page, and so part of me was thinking, "I'm sure this wasn't here before." <laughs> well, you know, where did where did all this come from? And the the, the, the amazing thing was that I not I not only had I, had I written it, <laughs> but I I checked it, I had proofread it, and I I knew the text. I could recite whole chunks of the of the text, and I just hadn't noticed how riddled with with fear it was because that was just that was normal, <laughs> that was the world, and then. Looking at it twenty-five years later, it's like, gee, I was really a mess. <laughs> look at look at that. Uh, 
Now, it's uh, the kind of emotions I've been referring to, things like uh, sexual desire or jealousy or fear, uh, uh, anger. Um, these are sort of easily uh, sort of kind of sharp-edged <laughs> Uh, emotional states are very, very sort of vivid and uh, uh, discernible. But it's also this same uh, practice. It, it can be um, used with with more, um, say, subtle kinds of emotions or uh, emotions that that are, are, are far more, um, say, uh, uh, far less sort of sharp edged or distinct. But, it, but in a way, uh, uh, equally as strong. So they, the feelings of depression or, or sadness or feelings of of um, just being stuck and uh, that uh, what we might not feel like it's an emotion at all. <laughs> it might just feel like a kind of deadness or a dullness or a blandness. Um, but uh, this, this same kind of practice, it works equally effectively and, and is, uh, is marvelously... Uh, um, say uh, uh, sign- uh, it kind of work- it's, it's very significant, and it works as effectively with uh, these far more sort of blurry edged, or dull, or, or um, uh, oppressive, or, or, or depressive states, and that uh, that um, Capacity to, uh, to uh, uh, the main the main um, way of accessing the, the capacity uh, to to free the heart from those same kind of states. It works in exactly the same way, so that uh, as the mind gets drawn into those of say self-critical or, or depressive and heavy uh, states, whether it's a, a depression that that moves towards sort of dullness and kind of catatonia, or also depression which is it kind of can look like it, there's a sort of stuckness or or a um, um, a kind of frozenness from outside, you know, that the, the kind of state where you're stuck in an armchair for three hours. But like uh, in William Styron's very um, wonderful little book called Darkness Visible, where he talks about his own depression. Uh, William Styron was a, a famous novelist, wrote uh, Sophie's Choice. And this is a thin book he wrote about his own uh, depression uh, problems. He said it's really strange that you use this word that that he also refers to like a shallow dent in the ground, because his internal experience of depression was actually like being in a whirlwind. But he just sort of would be so static and frozen because he's just sort of trying to hold his world still. Because inside there's this uh, this uh, turbulent confusion and and uh, uh, and sort of mess of of negative self-critical states. So whether that the, these uh, these states are, are um, say inten- they're felt in an intense way uh, in, internally, or whether they're they're tremendously sort of dull or negative and, and, and prone towards the mind moves towards sort of sleepiness and and a, 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 a heaviness, uh, it works in exactly the same way. So just to be able to bring the attention to the physical sensation of it, and just to also along with that. To, to use a, a simple um, kind of uh, of naming of what is present. So that's like this, this is, I would say to myself, this is the feeling of fear, this is the feeling of anxiety, or you know, who's afraid and what's there to be afraid of? In even w- with the same kind of um, uh, approach, you can say this is the feeling of stuckness, this is the the feeling of of heaviness, this is this is a this is the uh, the, the dull, depressive, self-hatred feeling. It's like this. Here it is. And the the degree to which the, the that can be named, and there's a, a recognition of, you know, this is the sensation of it. This is the, the, the experience of it. It feels like this. At that moment, that which knows the feeling is like this is not caught in the feeling. That which knows this is the feeling of stuckness. That which knows the stuckness is not stuck. Even though that feeling might still be there, it might be a very pervasive and, and heavy, com, com, you know, com, com, convincing and compelling feeling. At that moment, I would I would suggest, and my my own experience would be that to 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 notice and to 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 respect that. Oh yeah, that look at that. That in this moment of of the mind being, the, the feeling of being caught up in this or, or, or oppressed by this, that which knows the feeling of oppressedness 
is not actually oppressed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, that, that, so that it, the, when when you're able to reflect, this is the feeling of stuckness, totally stuck. This is the the feeling of there's no way out of this ness. <laughs> That's what this feeling is. At that moment, you're awakening the intuition that ah, this is a feeling. This is something that has a beginning and an end. It's not. It's not something that's absolutely real. It's not absolutely solid. It's not completely who and what I am, and and that's not just wishful thinking, <laughs> but in, in a in mysterious way, that reflection uh, in a, it touches that you, that in you which knows that to be true. Oh, this it, this is a very pervasive or a, a dense or a, a potent feeling, but it is just a feeling. I mean, obviously, just can be a very very big word. <laughs> But there is something in the heart that recognizes, yeah, this is just a feeling, and and it's not, uh, you know, who and what I am. So if we um, develop this kind of um, practice and cultivate this way of of uh, handling emotional states, whether they're coarse or subtle, whether they're sharp-edged and, and active, or whether they are inclining us towards uh, towards uh, depressive or, or heavy states, uh, wherever they've come from, uh, in the same way that when we're able to, to really know them and receive them, then they, uh, they're they known to be uh, patterns of, of a natural order. And so we, we are, we're far more able to take them less personally, rather than Thinking of them as oh, my problem, or I've got uh, this is this is what I am. This is this is me. This is mine. There's a, a shifting of perspective, so that we're able to see. You know, this is this is a uh, just you know, one of the things that that uh, as a human being that we can experience. And here it is. And it feels like this. And in that uh, shifting of perspective, there's um, the heart is much more able to relate compassionately towards your own life and towards what you're experiencing, and rather than getting caught up in self-criticism or self-hatred or thinking, I, feeling like I really should be doing better or this is this is hopeless, I've been doing this for years and I'm still caught up in this, that there's a compassion that says, oh yeah, this is what it's like for us as human beings. This is, this is the way we are. And out of that compassionate attitude, then we're um, bringing that, that metta karuna, loving kindness and compassion to the way, uh, the way that things are then we're at that very moment we're creating the causes for um, letting that those habits end. We're not feeding those habits to and, and recreating them. One of the another simple exercise that uh, I like to encourage in this respect, um, particular and this is particularly important and useful with self criticism. Like if you if you have a, a, a very uh, um, well-developed inner critic. It's got a long list of all the things that are wrong with you. It's ready to repeat them with great regularity. <laughs> this to uh, and the very convincing evidence of why you're, you know, you're an awful, terrible, you know, rotten person. Then, uh, in the uh, in listening to that and receiving that, then uh, one one little exercise I like to to suggest is uh, say when you you're um, you're thinking about yourself in that way. It's like so. If if you were your best friend, say, it's a, it's a kind of a mind game. It's a sort of an, an imaginative exercise. But if you were your best friend, and your best friend came to you and said, "Oh, I'm such a terrible person because I have these kind of thoughts and I have these kind of feelings and I have these sort of obsessions that I hang on to all the time," and and so I, I'm such an awful rotten person. That uh, I, I hate myself because I have the, all these negative and, and um, hor uh, horrible habits. If uh, if your friend came to you and then unloaded themselves and described themselves in this way, what would be the first re reaction that that uh, arises in your heart? And invariably, if you if you carry this, if you actually carry out this little exercise, if you're following what I'm saying. If uh, if your your friend came to you and, and described how, you know, how all her, her terrible and awful attributes, the first thing that arises in your heart is forgiveness and compassion. 
that uh, that uh, you're immediately the heart moves to well, you're not that bad, or you well, don't worry about that, or that's not it's not so awful, or don't be so hard on yourself. Every time that uh, if you if you carry this out, invariably that's the the first response. Yeah, I've never known when I've encouraged anyone to try this for them to 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 have the experience of their their first reaction being yeah right and another thing you know <laughs> I've got a list too I'd be meaning to tell you you know <laughs> it doesn't work that way I mean maybe because I'm I'm generally talking to people who are Buddhist meditators <laughs> rather than sort of gun toting you know, uh, uh, angry people uh, or professional kind of violent types but. It, it's it's very striking how if you were your best friend and and uh, and they came to you and gave and started to recite the list of all the sort of all the things that were wrong with them, immediately there's forgiveness, there's compassion, and, and oh, it's not that bad. Oh, don't worry. Oh, oh, well, we all make mistakes. Well, you know, you were seventeen at the time, of course. You know, we were all stupid when we were seventeen. You know, don't worry about it. And so that. Um, as a, again, a little exercise uh, to do um, uh, to soften the edges of the <laughs> of the inner critic, but uh, uh, it's in, in the same vein. It's learning how not to take our own life personally. To quote uh, Lumpur Zumedo, to 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 see our our own life, the patterns of our experience and our habits, with a, a, a an extra degree of, of objectivity. And the more that we can we can do that and learn to listen to our own thoughts and, and habitual judgments during the course of the day, then again, uh, it helps to sustain a, a balanced and um, a far more well-integrated uh, attitude toward, towards our life. So that carrying out the, carrying the spirit of this retreat and carrying the spirit of this practice into the, the more complex and demanding environment outside of Amravati Retreat Center, you know, these these ways of learning to to work with our emotions, work with our, our thoughts, and particularly with the self-critical thoughts, these are a, a very direct and and uh, and helpful means to to sort of sh- to to you know reshape the the world that we're we're living in, to reshape the world that we're creating each day. The um, another of the aspects maybe that I seem to just to reflect on this evening is that one of the reasons why you're able to keep um, the you know, so focused on the meditation, and how you're able to to uh, commit so many hours to bringing attention to your your mind and to to training yourself is because everybody else is here, right? <laughs> and uh, as the Buddha famously said, when Ananda, in another of these um, not so Ananda scenarios, <laughs> one of the most famous not so Ananda instances, where Ananda says, uh, "You know, I uh, I think you know, that spiritual friendship, Kalyana Mitta, is half of the holy life," and the the implication being that Ananda thinks he's being generous, saying fifty percent. He thinks that's a, that's a kind of generous estimate that to say that you know, half of the holy life is spiritual friendship. And uh, uh, which you know, uh, w- would seem to be a kind of, um, uh, say, an optimistic statement because of you know, you'd think to say, well, look, keeping the precepts is is a large proportion, or practicing meditation is a large proportion. So Ananda saying at least you know half of the holy life is spiritual friendship, and you know the the implication in the tone of it is that Ananda thinks he might be overstepping the mark and, and kind of overestimating how important spiritual friendship is. And then, to his surprise, uh, the Buddha then says, "Well, not so, Ananda. It's not half the spiritual life. It's the whole of the holy life. Kalyanamitta is the whole of the holy life." <laughs> and uh, then he goes on to to point out that uh, there's there's two different um, aspects to this. And in the Buddha, in, in a, a very, a very beautiful and clever wordplay, the, the the word kalyana mitta is made of two parts: kalyana, which means wholesome or, or noble, um, good, and mitta, which means friend. So he says, uh, uh, having good friends, having spiritual friends and supportive companions, you know, this is um, 
this is, uh, uh, say, the most important thing in terms of sustaining our spiritual efforts on the external level. But, uh, f- but the on, on an internal level, friendship with the with the with the holy, friendship with the the wholesome. So, uh, it's not just having spiritual friends, but friendship with the spiritual. So internally, um, inclining towards the wholesome. That, uh, in a way, that that's the internal aspect of refuge in sangha. That's the that in us which loves the good, that in us which inclines towards the wholesome. That the Buddha said that this is also kalyanamitta, is that friendship, friendship, befriending and uh, affinity with uh, affiliation with the holy, with the wholesome, uh, in your own uh, your own heart. That is also the the uh, the the, kind of, uh, the core of the spiritual life, and so on. externally it's having spiritual uh, noble spiritual companions, and internally it's the that inclination, the love of the good, uh, the inclination towards the wholesome. So uh, I, I uh, fully acknowledge that I wouldn't have a, a prayer in, <laughs> and, uh, and I wouldn't have had a, any hope whatsoever of. Of any real spiritual development without having a large crowd of helpful, supportive companions around for the last thirty-five years, I'm sure I would have been much more, <laughs> dis- uh, far more distracted and and lost and carried a- away by my own uh, uh, impulses and compulsions and, and bright ideas. And uh, having a, a large crowd of uh, good-hearted and like-minded people around me. Um, was uh, has been a, a immeasurably beneficial support, and so that uh, in in sustaining your spiritual life and sustaining the spirit of the retreat, and seek out <laughs> good friends and uh, stay in touch with each other and uh, uh, find like-minded and helpful, supportive people that are, are nearby you physically, or at least uh, exchange Skype addresses. <laughs> Talk to each other, connect up with each other, and uh, uh, say be available for each other because this is a tough business. You're know, trying to to stay um, balanced and and to to, uh, to to love the good in a world which is increasingly distracted and and confused and and um, chaotic. You know, day by day, year by year, it gets more and more busy and and uh, distracting, distracted. So. Uh, it's uh, more and more important and to to stay close to and, and to spend time with like-minded people, people who also love the good and, and uh, inc- want to incline towards peacefulness and uh, unselfishness, who really want to, to liberate the heart. So whatever ways you, you can, I encourage that kind of connecting with and giving time and attention to your spiritual friends. And those of you who've been in... Uh, AA groups uh, and twelve-step programs uh, will know it's it's an absolute linchpin of of Alcoholics Anonymous is the other people in the group. You know, they're going to meetings and uh, uh, being supported by the the others. I, I haven't been in AA myself, not as an official member, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I spend a lot of time with with many people who who have been or who are. And that uh, it's been really striking. I'm struck by, in so many ways, by the extreme skillfulness of the AA um, uh, system, and particularly the 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 power of Kalyanamitta that's recognised within that, and the, so the the effect of having supportive and like-minded friends. That it's not just one individual trying to get off the stuff, you know, whether it's a, a an eating disorder or whether it's alcohol or whether it's uh, tobacco or or uh, whatever. The uh, um, particular uh, obsession or compulsion might be having being around like-minded people who have similar issues and working and going through the same difficulties. It is an enormous benefit. It's an incredibly powerful support. And so I, I would really uh, you know, recommend you know, as not not looking down on on the spiritual friendship or not belittling the 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 power of having. Uh, like-minded companions making the effort to be around um, like-minded and supportive people because it's easy for all of us to get distracted, to get lost, to get carried away. And I, I'm not kidding. I'm not just sort of speaking lightly. That I, if I if I had come across the Buddhist teachings and come across Buddhist meditation and I hadn't 
um, had the, the, the Sangha of Ajahn Chah's disciples, if I'd been trying to sort of make it on my own, uh, living, in, uh, living in London, uh, <laughs> I would have probably lasted a couple of weeks you know, that, uh, before getting pulled off on some sidetrack. And that uh, the, um, uh, so I feel incredibly grateful to the, uh, immeasurably grateful to the, the spiritual companions and support that, that I've had over the years, and I feel that that's uh, something to to really uh, respect and, and to to make effort with. Because also, not only do you receive benefit from the the efforts of of your kalyanamita, but they are also benefited by you. Even when you think that you're struggling miserably, uh, I mean, is, how many times um, have a, <coughs> have you sort of come to a meditation hall and thought? Oh, I'm in a real mess, and you know my mind's all over the place. But you know, well, everyone else is really. They all look so peaceful and composed. But you know, I guess I should carry on, and and uh, and so that you you carry on putting effort into it because of the the commitment and strength of the people around you. And, and at the same time, they're all thinking, <laughs> "Well, my mind's a mess, and I'm all over the place." But you know, well, you know, he's really look. Look, he looks so peaceful, so calm. He's so so composed. <laughs> And we're all thinking that, and and so we're all sort of buoying each other up uh, and uh, helping each other along. Whereas um, that uh, and it's that that uh, we don't. You know, I'm sure none of you are sitting here thinking, "I'm giving you a, a what what a, what a wonderful thing! I'm giving such a good example to everybody around me." We don't think that, right? Maybe some of you do. <laughs> My guess would be that none of us are thinking you know, how much I'm helping everybody else by the fact that I'm sitting here, you know, dealing with a whole stream of, of unskillful thoughts. But, um, but we are, and that, that uh, the efforts that we're making, even though we might have a very negative impression of that, is helping other people. We're we're providing a, a, a supportive presence for others, and that's a gift. That's a very lovely gift that we can offer, and. Uh, not also not to be, not to be uh, sneezed at, not to be um, belittled or, or, or ignored. So, in in terms of carrying on that this um, the, the spirit of the retreat, I would uh, urge that sort of creative development of, of Kalyanamita and um, to to find ways to to support each other and to to join together and to to uh, fulfil your own. Um, Aspirations to sort of help you in, uh, encourage each other in in uh, developing the good because you know not to sort of be condemnatory about society in general but <laughs> yeah even good-hearted people spend a, you know, an incredible amount of time on completely pointless things <laughs> you know that the, that the, it's just how much time can we waste just having conversations about home improvements and <laughs> past holidays next year's holidays. What's on the television? Yeah, just endless uh, trivia that 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 um, yeah, innocent enough, harmless enough. But you know, do they re- <laughs> do we really need to be concerned, or do we really need to spend our time just caught up in in uh, in in all of that? And uh, really, you know, crucial and potent elements of our lives are just being overlooked or ignored, and and so. Um, that um, I would just like to, to to leave that with you this evening to to um, just to be uh, reflecting as the the last few days um, uh, together that we have to to be um, considering and uh, if uh, if there are ways um, that you can be supported by others or ways that you can support others in the, in the, the the groups that you belong to or where you live or or the way that you you function and just also. To um, to recognize how uh, how important that is to just let that um, be be cognized that how the um, uh, the so many of the important lessons that we learn the spiritual qualities that we develop is dependent has arisen because of of our spiritual companions and that uh, that uh, in a way to uh, acknowledge and, and cultivate the sense of gratitude for the the blessings that we've received from from uh, uh, everybody who's here and the, the, those who've helped us along the way. So I'll offer those uh, thoughts for reflection this evening.